So welcome everyone to our weekly uh, UCSF orthopedic surgery grand rounds. Uh, today, I have the honor of introducing uh, one of our current residents, Dr. Tiffany Liu. Uh, Dr. Liu is uh, originally from Southern California and then uh, went to Princeton for undergrad. And uh, she studied evolutionary biology there, wrote a thesis on howler monkeys. And I think you'll see a lot of that work come through in her talk today. Um, and then she worked some and then went to um, Penn for medical school. And then um, during medical school, she actually spent a year um, at University of Texas um, and was a value-based um, care uh, fellow. And um, I think a lot of that work has also um, shaped you know, her outlook um, on medicine currently. Uh, she's done a great job um, you know, with us during residency. Um, she's um, uh, had numerous productive research experiences, has had um, fast track grant funding, um, and is currently applying uh, for a hand surgery fellowship. Um, and then she's going to speak to us today on pain and cognitive bias in orthopedic surgery uh, and evolutionary perspective. So Dr. Liu, thank you for presenting today and I look forward to your talk. All right, thank you, Dr. Lansdowne, for that introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be speaking on this topic, uh, and I hope that I'm able to bring a different perspective to a challenging problem that we all face. And I'm happy to announce that we have Dr. David Ring joining us from UT Austin. Uh, Dr. Ring is the Upper Extremity Clinical Director of UT Health Austin's Musculoskeletal Institute, uh, and he's the Associate Dean for Comprehensive Care uh, for the Dell Medical School Department of Surgery and Perioperative Care. He's one of the leading researchers on pain and cognitive bias in orthopedics, and we owe much of our understanding uh, to, in this area to his work. I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. And my objectives for today are to review the concepts of pain and cognitive bias as they apply to orthopedics, understand the evolutionary basis of physiological and cognitive adaptations and their impact on modern orthopedics, and discuss tactics to help us address pain perception as a modifiable risk factor for patient outcomes. And this talk is not meant to be an exhaustive review on how to treat pain, uh, but rather to approach this concept from a different perspective in order to spur discussion on how to better help our patients understand and manage their pain. By now, we're all very familiar with the scope, impact, and consequences of the opioid epidemic, with tens of thousands of deaths from drug overdoses and millions more misusing prescription opioids. And despite recent efforts to combat this opioid epidemic, this is still a pressing issue driven by a rise in overdose deaths in the last two years that's coincided with pandemic restrictions. And as orthopedic surgeons, we are on the front lines of this battle as we tra treat pain on a day-to-day -day basis in every orthopedic subspecialty. And this is because orthopedic conditions are a major driver of, opi of opioid prescriptions. Among adults insured through TRICARE, the insurance plan of the US Department of Defense which covers active duty and retired service members, as well as their dependents, spine and orthopedic conditions were the number one and number two reasons for opioid prescriptions for those who were previously opioid naive. And this holds true in the commercially insured population as well. One study looking at adults insured by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, uh, consisting about 50% of Michigan's com uh, commercially insured individuals, these patients who were opioid naive for one year prior to a variety of inpatient procedures found that those who underwent orthopedic and neurosurgical procedures were prescribed the most oral morphine equivalents. And the number of patients seeking our help is going to continue to increase. If you look back at the last two decades, the average percent of Americans requiring care for a musculoskeletal condition has increased by 21%. And while it's nice to feel like we have job security, this means that the discussion around pain and how to control it will continue to persist. So this talk is going to be relevant for everyone on this call, even those of us who are not spine surgeons seeing this sort of pain diagram in clinic every day. The bottom line is we all treat pain. And so for this talk, I'm going to first give an overview of pain and unhelpful thoughts. I'll review the biopsychosocial model of pain and discuss different mental health phenotypes. I'll then cover some of the evolutionary adaptations, both musculoskeletal and cognitive, that are relevant to orthopedics today, and tie this back to the modern day to review the impact of pain and cognitive bias on orthopedic outcomes. And lastly, I'll finish with some proposed tactics to, to address unhelpful thinking and improve, improve patient outcomes. 
First, we need to define what pain is. The International Association for the Study of Pain defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Now, pain is not the same as nociception, which is the neural process of encoding and processing noxious stimuli. The IASP further goes on to emphasize that pain is a personal, individualized experience that is influenced by biological, social, and psycho psychological factors, and it's learned through life experiences. And this is what makes pain such a difficult concept to define and address. Sensory lesions and dysfunction are something we can physically map and measure and provides us with a tangible target. But the emotional and mental aspects of pain are much more difficult. Our understanding of pain has evolved over time. The traditional biomedical model of pain states that pain is a sensation that's directly proportional to nociception and physiology. We now know that pain is more complex than that. As Dr. Gornitsky and Dr. Diab nicely summarized in this article, the biopsychosocial model recognizes that there are many other factors that are important to the pain experience. This includes biological factors, such as genetics and physiology, social factors, such as socioeconomic status, culture, and health literacy, and also psychological factors, such as depression, anxiety, and catastrophic thinking. The interplay of all these factors leads to a spectrum of pain responses, and we all fall somewhere on the spectrum. However, at one extreme of the spectrum, people with more unhelpful thoughts about pain have worse coping skills. And I'll go over two types of unhelpful thinking and, and misconceptions in particular. First, kinesiophobia is an excessive, irrational, and debil debilitating fear to carry out a physical movement. And catastrophic thinking is a persistently negative thinking style that leads to an exaggerated or consuming concern about actual or anticipated pain. And these types of un unhelpful thinking can be elicited with the help of questionnaires. The pain catastrophizing scale on the left includes statements such as, I worry that the pain will get worse. I can't seem to keep it out of my mind. And it's awful and I feel that it overwhelms me. And the Tampa scale for kinesiophobia just specifically deals with fear of movement with statements such as, I'm afraid that I might injure myself if I, might, if I exercise. Pain lets me know when to stop exercising so that I don't injure myself. And it's really not safe for a person with a condition like mine to be physically active. Research in multiple orthopedic specialties, ranging from arthroplasty, trauma, sports, and upper extremity, have shown that these uh, types of pain misconceptions are common and impact outcomes. And indeed, one study of 194 trauma patients found that at one year follow-up, 58% had kinesiophobia and 53% had pain catastrophizing. And among patients with common upper extremity conditions, such as trigger finger, carpal tunnel, first CMC arthritis, and distal radius fractures, factors such as depression, catastrophic thinking, kinesiophobia, and pain anxiety were all associated with lower functional scores. And in a multivariable regression analysis, accounting for sex, diagnosis, employment status, kinesiophobia, and catastrophic thinking, catastrophic thinking and kinesiophobia were the strongest independent, independent predictors of function, accounting for 17.7% and 6.3% of the variance in the model, respectively. And even though these types of unhelpful thinking are prevalent, we aren't always able to accurately identify these patients based on our clinical observations. This study, looking at 203 new patients presenting to 11 fellowship-trained arthroplasty, trauma, shoulder, foot and ankle, and hand surgeons, who had a mean of 18.4 years of experience, um, and based on their scores on the pain catastrophizing scale, these patients were dichotomized as either high or low catastrophizers. Surgeons were then asked to identify which patients were high or low catastrophizers, just based on their clinical interactions. Of the patients with high catastrophic thinking scores, less than half were correctly identified. And notably, women were more likely to be categorized as high catastrophizers by an odds ratio of two. And there is no impact of surgeon sex or experience on the accuracy of this. And it's important to be able to accurately identify patients with pain misconceptions because they can perpetuate disability. 
Unhelpful thoughts, such as pain catastrophizing, can lead to fear and kinesiophobia, which in turn can worsen the physical manifestations of inner injury, leading to worse pain. And it then becomes very difficult to escape the cycle of disability. There's also the impact of mental health to take into account. Mental health seems to play a role in the relationship between pain and function. As demonstrated in the study of 125 patients seeking orthopedic care who completed questionnaires measuring pain, function, depression and anxiety, and kinesiophobia and catastrophic thinking. Kinesiophobia and catastrophic thinking uh, had indirect effects on function and depression and anxiety moderated this fact. So at higher levels of depression and anxiety, kinesiophobia and catastrophic thinking had a greater impact on outcomes. Recent literature has sought to classify patients into mental health phenotypes, stratifying them based on symptoms of distress and unhealthy misconceptions regarding pain. Among 137 patients who were seeking hand and upper extremity care, researchers were able to classify them into these four phenotypes, which represent a spectrum of distress and pain misconceptions. Phenotype one consisted of patients with low misconceptions and low distress. Phenotype two consisted of patients with notable misconceptions about pain. Phenotype three uh, represented notable uh, depression and misconceptions. And phenotype four included patients who had notable anxiety, depression, and misconceptions. Patients in phenotype one, those who had low misconceptions and low distress, had, sig had significantly greater activity tolerance and pain self-efficacy than phenotype four, and also lower pain than phenotype three. Indeed, patients with phenotype four, so those with notable anxiety, depression, and misconceptions, reported that their upper extremity function was nearly two standard deviations below the population norm. So why do these types of unhelpful thinking about pain exist? In order to understand why we think this way, first we have to understand how we think. And this gets into the uh, topic of cognition. We owe much of our understanding of cognition to Daniel Kahneman, who is considered the father of behavioral economics and a Nobel Prize winner in, the, prize winner in this area. His book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which many people may have read, provides an excellent and approachable summary of his life's work on cognition. To briefly summarize, our cognition is predicated on two systems of thinking um, called system one and system two. System one is automatic, it's fast, and it's involuntary, but this makes it prone to error. It includes impulses, learned associations, and stereotypes. So examples of system one thinking would be hearing a sudden sound and trying to orient to the source of that sound, completing simple sentences in your own language, such as bread and blank, most people would fill in bread and butter, detecting hostility in a face or a voice, and finally, recognizing stereotypes, such as this well-known social media parody of an orthopedic surgeon who calls EKGs danger squiggles. System two, on the other hand, is slower, it requires effort, and it takes more cognitive resources. It's associated with logic, beliefs, and the conscious reasoning self. And when attention is taken away from system two thinking, uh, it, system two thinking is disrupted. Examples include trying to find a friend in a crowd, understanding complex relationships like the hip spine relationship, and trying to monitor the appropriateness of your behavior in a social situation, something that at least for me has become more difficult in the past two years under COVID. And usually both of these uh, systems are running. System one runs automatically and it's responsible for the majority of our cognition. And system two is mobilized when system one doesn't have an answer for a problem or when it gets surprised. So for example, easy highway driving falls under system one. It's fairly automatic for most of us. But if you encounter a portion of a collapsed road like this section on the way down to Big Sur, system two would kick into gear to help you problem solve. Now that only understand how we think, let's review to where we got, how we got to where we are today. And for this portion of my talk, I'm excited to discuss the physical and mental aspects of evolution that led us to where we are today. And quite frankly, this topic could be a standalone talk. So I'm only going to give a brief overview and go over a few examples. To quickly review, we, di we diverged from chimpanzees, our closest living ancestor about 7 million years ago. Obligate bipedal gait likely first developed about four to 5 million years ago. 
and continue to evolve over the next three million years. And anatomically modern humans, the species Homo sapiens, came into existence about 300,000 years ago. And a number of key musculoskeletal adaptations occurred throughout this process. Starting with our spine, the axial skeleton first evolved from lateral bending to sagittal bending. Lateral bending restricts an animal's ability to breathe and move at the same time, which is why lizards have to move in short bursts with breathing breaks. By moving to sagittal bending, our spine allowed us to uh, breathe and move at the same time. So everyone, give yourselves a pat on the back for this excellent adaptation. Bipedalism, in turn, was likely partially driven by the need for increased stamina and sustained locomotion. Upright locomotion doesn't load the thorax, unlike quadrupedal motion. So this allowed for further separation of locomotion and respiration. And to make bipedalism sustainable, further changes included a more mobile lumbar spine to allow for more lordosis. In contrast, for great, ape, great apes have a more immobile lumbar spine, which is old, results in the thorax essentially being directly attached to this pelvis. And while this may have been adapted for arboreation or swinging through the trees, this results in a bent hip, bent knee, bipedal gait that's energetically costly for long distances. And you can see that reflected in the high joint reaction forces at the hip throughout stance phase, as pictured by the dark blue lines on the graph. Increased lordosis uh, helped us gain the ability to fully extend our hips and knees during gait, which it reduces fatigue with upright walking. And if you're Dr. Alaba Habadi, you figured out that the way to minimize lower extremity joint reaction forces is to walk on your hands, but that's not most of us. These changes were accompanied by structural changes in the pelvis, notably broadening and flattening of the ilium, which enables our abductors to better stabilize our pelvis during single leg stance. You can see in this uh, diagram that the chimpanzee pelvis, the morphology is much different than other human pelvis. Other changes in the upper extremity also differentiates us from our ancestors, some of, which, some of which allowed us to specialize in throwing. Chimpanzees, in comparison, are only able to achieve one third the velocity of the average human male's throw, or much less than that of Dr. Coughlin's throws. And this is due to anatomic shifts that enable elastic energy to be restored and released efficiently. Our increased humoral retroversion allows us to achieve more external rotation during the cocking phase, allowing us to store more energy. And our glenoid is oriented more laterally than superiorly. And this aligns the flexion moment of the pec major around the axis of torque. Whereas for chimpanzees, a superiorly oriented glenoid was more advantageous for climbing. And many people think of the opposable thumb as a defining feature of humans, but in actuality, many other species have opposable digits as well. This includes the primates such as great apes, lesser apes, and old world monkeys, but also reptiles such as chameleons and marsupials such as possums. And why stop at just one opposable thumb? Koalas actually have two opposable thumbs, little known fact. But don't worry, just because we are not the only animals with opposable thumbs doesn't mean we're not special. Our hands differentiate us in other ways. We have a longer thumb relative to the other rays, an independent FPL, and larger intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the hand. This allows us to form unique grips, such as the cupping grip, which allows our hand to conform to variably shaped objects. This is driven by the shape of our carpometacarpal articulations, which allow for second and third metacarpal pronation with finger flexion, uh, and fourth, while the fifth, fourth and fifth metacarpals supinate. Precision grip is due to a strong independent FBL, which allows our thumb to forcefully oppose each other digital pad, as well as a broader first metacarpal head to help accommodate the increased forces that the thumb seeks. And finally, the power grip. This is achieved by large extrinsic and intrinsic thumb muscles and a deep palmar fat pad, as well as an ulna that is uncoupled from the carpus, allowing for more ulnar deviation. These changes combined uh, to give us the a manipulative ability to use tools. While there are other animals such as primates and otters that use tools, um, researchers found evidence for stone tools use from about 2.8 million years ago in Old Bag Gorge. Not only that, but there was evidence that human had, humans had used these tools to make other tools, which is different from that of other animal species. Researchers therefore named the species Homo habilis, or handyman.
Stone tool use in turn spurred a slew of social, cognitive, and language development that was highly impactful on human development. And if you're interested in this topic, this is beautifully detailed in the book, The Hand by Frank Wilson. And now that our global rotations have restarted, those who go to Tanzania can travel to Ultra Gorge themselves. While these adaptations were unquestionably integral to our advancement as a species, modern humans do have to face some unintended uh, consequences. And while we can't blame everything on our ancestors, there does seem to be a physiologic basis in some of the conditions we see in clinic today. Basal joint arthritis has not been identified in great apes and other primates. And in fact, other primates develop uh, wrist arthritis from knuckle walking. So this is likely partially related to the unique morphology of our first CMC joint, which is more shallow than that of other primates, allowing for more excursion and circumduction of our thumb. In chimpanzees, first CMC motion is limited to flexion and extension only, and this provides them a very stable pinch grip, but doesn't allow them to pose their thumb to other, all the other digits. In looking at wear patterns of the trapezium in patients with thumb arthritis, Researchers have identified that the areas of most cartilage wear are the same areas that see the most forces in, in, in daily grips, such as pinch grip, key grip, um, and power grip. Another condition unique to humans is femoral acetabular impingement, and here I'll be specifically talking about hand deformities of the proximal femur. This study comparing proximal femur specimens from each species to specimens from humans demonstrated that modern humans have less concavity of the proximal femur, partially due to a wider femoral neck and also reduced ferocity of the femoral head. This may have been a response to upright bipedal gait because proximal femur concavity was no longer as important for humans who were not doing as much climbing as apes were. Indeed, decreased concavity of the proximal femur reduces tensile stresses on the femoral neck and is protective against fractures. And finally, Scoliosis and spondylolysis are uh, also seem to be uniquely human conditions related to bipedalism. And not only have these um, not been identified in apes, but spondylolysis has never, has never been seen in uh, non-walking humans. Bipedal loco uh, locomotion was likely so energetically favorable that rapid lengthening of the spine occurred, leading to substantial evidence for scoliosis in Homo erectus. This then resulted in a decrease in the number of lumbar vertebrae. But in order to maintain our sagittal balance, the lordotic angle of each vertebra increased, predisposing us to spondylolysis. And this is actually known as the overshoot hypothesis, where spondylolit spondylolytic human vertebrae have more dorsal wedging than both normal human vertebrae, as well as that of chimps and gorillas. And similar to the physical adaptations, certain cognitive traits that turned out to be favorable were selected for as well. Cognitive bias occurs when our cognition forms a representation that is distorted compared to objective reality, and heuristics are shortcuts in thinking. All of these can be helpful for making quick decisions that are necessary for survival. For example, when you see this lion staring at you, it's safer to assume that you should run than to assume that you can ignore him. This is evolutionarily adaptive and can be explained by something called error management theory which states that when the fitness cost of certain errors is higher than that of others, so for example, not running away from a hungry lion versus wasting the energy running away from a false alarm, a bias towards making the less costly error will evolve, even if you make, make repeated uh, less costly errors. One type of cognitive bias known as the negativity bias causes us to respond more strongly to negative stimuli than positive or neutral stimuli as it's harder to, harder to reverse a harmful event, such as being eaten by a lion. Furthermore, negative reinforcement leads to faster learning and slower extinction of learned behaviors. And you can think that catastrophic thinking is perhaps the most extreme response to pain as a negative stimulus. Another type of cognitive bias is, uh, is framing bias. Dr. Erica Roddy did an excellent job discussing this in her grand rounds on shared decision-making last year. But to quickly review, Framing bias occurs when an individual's decision is influenced by how the information is presented. And uh, framing bias can be driven by loss aversion, which is a stronger preference for avoiding losses than potentially achieving gains. And this has been studied in uh, different areas of orthopedics. 
In a study on surgical decision-making in rotator cuff surgery, patients were more likely to choose surgery when presented with a 71% chance that the rotator cuff remains healed at two-year follow-up compared to a 29% chance of retail. In the first scenario, 84% of patients chose surgery as compared to only 46% in the second scenario. And in an orthopedic oncology study, looking at limb salvage versus amputation and patient decision-making, respondents were twice as likely to choose amputation when it was presented as a way to mitigate functional loss than when limb salvage was presented as a chance for functional gain over amputation. And interestingly, in this study, patients who chose amputation were more likely to have more depressive symptoms, again, suggesting that mental health and cognitive bias are linked. Along these lines, we can imagine that catastrophic thinking and kinesiophobia are extremes at the end of a spectrum of adaptive responses to injury. After all, an animal that shows signs of illness or injury is more vulnerable to attack by predators. So recognizing the consequences of your pain as an injury and minimizing your chances of aggravating an injury would help to maximize your chances of survival. And while there is no fossil record for the mental evolutionary adaptations, these, are just as, these were just as important for human survival and evolution as the physiological ones. But you might ask why this is relevant to the modern day. After all, we no longer need to run from lions for survival. And the most frightening thing we need to worry about day to day are my charting boxes. But it's because we still see the effects of strong evolutionary pressures that selected for these types of cognitive bias. A prospective study of patients undergoing knee arthroplasty were administer, administered the pain catastrophizing scale preoperatively. Functional outcomes were then assessed postoperatively at four months and 12 months. Patients with greater catastrophic thinking presented with worse baseline functional status. And while all patients in the study achieved the minimum clinically important difference in the Oxford knee score, patients with catastrophic thinking actually had larger functional improvements but they had persistently worse outcomes, both at four months and even at 12 months postoperatively. And furthermore, they were more likely to report moderate or severe pain at one year, with an odds ratio of 2.7 for those undergoing total knee arthroplasty and 4.8 for those undergoing uni compartmental knee arthroplasty. Likewise, in 118 patients who underwent primary flexor or extensor tendon repair, 59% had clinically relevant kinesiophobia, and these patients were more likely to report significantly worse disability on the Michigan Hand Outcomes Questionnaire, despite similar performance on objective measures, such as grip strength and pinch strength. So now that we've seen how mis pain misconceptions can affect outcomes, let's talk about what we can do to address these. Now, I know we're all in orthopedics because we like tangible, concrete solutions. But even though mental health and negative thinking are intangible, they deserve just as much attention. In order to help our patients overcome unhelpful thinking, we need to address them. And this starts with education. Just like we educate patients on the pathophysiology and natural history of their physical conditions, we should do the same for their pain and mental health. A Cochrane review of 21 randomized control trials comparing exercise programs to control in patients with osteoarthritis included a qualitative summary in their paper and found that confusion about pain impacted patients' behaviors and activity level because patients were afraid they would cause themselves harm if they were to exercise. And after treatment, positive changes in pain and function were often attributed to increased understanding about their condition from the knowledge that they gained from healthcare professionals throughout the treatment. So we should make it a point to help patients understand the physiologic as well as psychological basis of their pain. So how do we do this? One way to do so is motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing is a method of communication that helps patients generate self-reflection on their behavior and thereby increases their intrinsic motivation to change that behavior. Motivational interviewing is not meant to just direct people to change. It's meant to empower them to make changes in their life and to guide them through this process. The core elements of motivational interviewing involve forming a partnership in order to elicit the priorities, values, and skills needed to generate change approaching the conversation with acceptance and compassion, 
asking open-ended questions and reflecting on the other person's answers and affirming the other patient's efforts, strengths, and past successes, thereby building hope and confidence for change. It's a very collaborative style of communication. This randomized controlled trial out of Stanford invested the, investigated the impact of motivational interviewing on opioid cessation. In this study, 104 patients who had undergone total drug replacement and were still using opiates at two weeks post-op were randomized to usual care, which was a written handout with instructions on pain control or the study group. Patients in the study group received weekly motivational interviewing calls by a pain medicine physician with the goal of achieving a 25% dose reduction per week. These calls were weekly for seven weeks and then monthly up to one year or until patients reported opioid cessation. And patients in the study group were able to decrease their opioid use significantly faster. They returned to their baseline level of use at a mean of 35 days compared to 68 days in the usual care group. Mindfulness is another tactic that's been studied. Mindfulness is defined as a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations. The goal of mindfulness is to allow unpleasant thoughts and feelings to move in the background rather than dictating behavior. In one randomized controlled trial, 125 patients presenting to an upper extremity orthopedic practice were randomized to a 60-second online mindfulness-based exercise versus an educational pamphlet on pain and stress. The mindfulness website um, is an exercise that asks you to enter in a stressful thought, and then it shows the stressful thought shrinking in size as captions tell you that everything is going to be okay and that this thought does not matter. And this 60 second video resulted in significantly improved pain intensity, anxiety, depression, and anger. And patients also had a less than one point uh, decrease in pain on the NRS. So this change was less than the minimum clinically important difference. Cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT is a type of psychotherapy that aims to teach coping, coping mechanisms by teaching cognitive reframing techniques. The core principles that CBT is based on states that psychological problems are based in part on faulty or unhelpful ways of thinking, as well as learned patterns of unhelpful behavior. So CBT aims to change both thinking patterns and behavior patterns. And examples of ways in which CBT helps people to learn to cope include learning to recognize one's distortions in thinking that are creating problems, helping people to reevaluate these patterns of thinking, using problem-solving skills to cope with dis, uh, difficult situations, and learning to calm one's body and uh, calm one's mind and relax one's body. And this has been studied in orthopedics. In this randomized control trial of 130 patients with spondyloesthesis, lumbar spinal stenosis, and low back pain and sciatica, um, patients were randomized to either exercise alone or exercise with CBT. The CBT program sought to modify catastrophizing and kinesiophobia through graded exposure to situations that patients had previously identified as dangerous. And the CBT consisted of 60 minute sessions twice a week for four weeks. Patients uh, in the study group, the CBT group, uh, demonstrated greater improvements in function as measured by the Oswestry Disability Index, pain, kinesiophobia, and catastrophizing. And these changes were all sustained at one year follow-up. However, CBT can be hard to standardize. A systematic review focusing on RCTs in lumbar spine surgery found that preoperative CBT did improve quality of life and psychological outcomes uh, postoperatively. But the authors noted that there was large heterogeneity in studies and that effects were moderated by CBT session frequency, as you might expect. And other studies, such as this multi-center randomized control trial of patients undergoing primary knee arthroplasty, have not shown sustained benefits in pain or function following CBT. And this was despite a 73% adherence rate. The final study I'll review focused on 104 work comp claimants uh, in Nova Scotia who had been off of work for at least six weeks for a back injury. And in fact, the mean time off work 
had the first treatment session had been 18 weeks with clinicians. These participants underwent a 10 week program with weekly sessions with clinicians. And the program consisted of both a structured increase in activity, as well as a cognitive restructuring of pain beliefs, or generating awareness of the impact of negative thinking on well being, as well as activity level. And authors found a 60% success rate with 45% of participants returning to work with by the end of the study period, um, and an additional 15% who had initiated the return to work process at the end of the treatment program. Pain catastrophizing and kinesiophobia overall decreased significantly over the treatment course. However, when you looked at patients who did not return to work, or those that considered that authors termed treatment failures, they all had greater negative affective thoughts both pre-treatment and post-treatment. So now that we've reviewed some of the interventions that address uh, cognitive bias, I'll present some tactics that we can implement in our day-to-day -day clinic. Despite all the research showing the importance of psychological factors on orthopedic outcomes, there's still a stigma against talking about mental health and it can be an uncomfortable discussion. For us as surgeons, we're challenged by, again, the intangible nature of mental health and pain perceptions and how there isn't a concrete analog. But we have to be open to having these discussions and proactively bringing it up because we can't change anything if we don't talk about it. And by not talking about this, we're missing a key opportunity to improve our patient outcomes. And we need to have empathy during these discussions. Remember that pain is a very individual experience and influenced by um, a whole bunch of factors that I haven't discussed, culture, race, socioeconomic status, and others. And so we need to first validate our patients' pain experiences before we can guide and coach them to a healthier interpretation of their symptoms. We need to accept ownership of the psychological factors uh, impacting pain. Like it or not, we are the front line in treating our patient's pain. It's a major reason why they come to see us. And importantly, these cognitive biases affect our surgical outcomes. So ignoring this modifiable risk factor does ourselves and our patients a disservice. Therefore, we need to create the space and the time to incorporate this into our practice. And now that I've mentioned the elephant in the room, time. In our fee-for-service system, we are under tremendous pressure to see more patients and generate more RVUs. And so creating time seems like magical thinking. So this is where we need to rely on a multi multidisciplinary team uh, and all of our team members, including other staff members, as well as advanced practice providers. We need to know who is at risk so we know who to help. And this starts with administering mental health questionnaires. And I would argue that this should be included in our preoperative workup, just like how we order labs and imaging. Only once we identify someone's mental health phenotype can we intervene to modify uh, this risk factor. And while survey fatigue is a very real concern, our ability to identify catastrophic thinking and kinesiophobia in patients is poor. As a study I uh, referenced at the, at the beginning of the talk, show that the chances of correctly identifying an at-risk patient with a uh, during a clinical encounter was worse than a coin flip. So in this age of checklists, um, including our surgical safety checklist, I would argue that this is an item that we should add to our preoperative workup. Next, we should improve our training to help us be better equipped to tackle these issues. We need to learn about mental health conditions, just like we do about physical conditions. Similar to how we classify the degree of ACL laxity, we should consider a patient's mental health phenotype as integral to their health status. And we should be taught that there is an evolutionary basis for these types of pain perceptions so that we and our patients understand the entrenched nature of these cognitive biases. And we should incorporate formal training on tactics such as motivational interviewing to help us be better equipped to coach our patients through difficult situations. And this is a multidisciplinary problem, which requires a multidisciplinary solution. So we should enlist the help of other providers to help our patients. Just as we have physiatry and other non-operative colleagues, we should consider establishing relationships with pain psychologists to whom we can refer our patients. Next, PCPs and care coordinators can help get our patients plugged into the right resources. By building a more robust patient-centered care team, we can have more hands helping with these action items 
such as collecting questionnaires and coordinating treatment and follow-up. In this electronic age, we should use the tools that are at, that are at our disposal. Many pods are already collecting uh, electronic patient reported outcome measures through code technology, which has the benefit of having a centralized portal to display results from these questionnaires. Consider adding one of these measures to see where your patients fall with catastrophic became kinesiophobia. We should also use my chart to help us deliver information and interventions to our patients, such as that 60 second uh, video, um, online video on mindfulness. And for those of our patients who may not have technological access or literacy, we should account for this during the clinic visit uh, so we don't ignore this patient population. And this includes either time or assistance in accessing online resources. And finally, we need to better understand pain-related cognitive biases and how to intervene. This means that we need to devote time and resources to studying this in our patient population. And given the multitude of factors impacting the pain experience, as summarized by the biopsychosocial model of pain, it can be hard to find definitive and unequivocal answers, but we shouldn't allow this to discourage us. Ideally, with better research, we would be able to uh, develop a risk stratification tool similar to the NISQIP calculator that takes into account these pain perceptions and help us predict our patient's outcomes. So let's revisit our objectives from the beginning of this talk. First, to review the concepts of pain and cognitive bias as they apply to orthopedics. We talked about the biopsychosocial model of pain, as well as uh, types of unhelpful thinking, including pain catastrophizing and kinesiophobia. Understand the evolutionary basis of physiological and cognitive adaptations and their impact on modern orthopedics. We discussed the evolutionary pressures that led to persistent physical and cognitive adaptation that we still see today. And finally, discuss tactics to help us address pain perception as a modifiable risk factor for patient outcomes. We just went through an action plan that I hope that we can all implement from here. I'd like to thank some people. First off, my husband for sitting through several versions of this talk, um, Dr. Diab for his encouragement to this process, Dr. Ring for helping me uh, with this talk and also for being here today. And finally, Dr. Lansdowne for organizing our brand new series. And also my classmates who have been very important uh, as a source of support during residency. And again, congratulations to those of you who matched yesterday on a very impressive match. So these are my references. And from here, thank you very much. And I will take any questions. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Liu. That was um, great and uh, very interesting to see you know, that evolutionary perspective. Um, and we'll open it up for questions. I see a hand up from Dr. O'Neill. So it will start with you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tiffany. That was awesome. Um, two things. One is I just want to put in a little plug for our non-operative spine program because we do have a, a program specifically that addresses uh, some of these, you know, barriers, psychosocial barriers. We, we use a tool called the uh, Start Back, uh, mm -hmm. which assesses catastrophic thinking, fear avoidance, um, and a number of other factors. So we, we do have that program running and, and I can attest to your comment about uh, the difficulty of <laughs> sustaining a program like that in, in right. the face of the economic pressures. The other question, I have a question for you though. Um, I think that you, sh you showed a slide where you suggested that the negativity bias is, is sort of the underlying cause of, of catastrophic thinking and fear avoidance. Um, is, is that something that you can measure, the negativity bias? And is this something that extends beyond reactions to pain? In other words, are those people that develop catastrophic thinking and fear avoidance, are they the same ones that would be you know, more likely to run, run from the lion? or? if we could find some way of sort of measuring that root cause for these maladaptive patterns, that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I, you know, I don't know of a measure to specifically measure the amount of negativity bias that someone has. Um, I think the pain catastrophizing skill is, you know, uh, if you think about pain catastrophizing or anticipating, you know, the worst case scenario from your pain as a form of negative bias, that's probably the best way to measure it. But I agree, it would be very interesting to, um, to try and identify how that applies more broadly. Thanks. Great talk. And uh, Dr. Saberwal. Yeah. 
thanks. Thanks, Drew. Uh, again, great talk, Tiffany. Really enjoyed it. I just have a question. You know, there wasn't much about kids and pediatric orthopedics, but I tell you anecdotally, I, I think I see a, a more of these traits of pain catastrophizing, et cetera, as transference from parents than kids themselves. Do you have any insight or suggestions on how to deal with those traits where it's really the caregiver more than the patient themselves who seem to have these issues? Yeah, great question. Um, I think there has been some work in this area, um, you know, specifically talk about, um, you know, caregiver anxiety. Uh, I will say that, you know, um, in, in rotating through pediatrics, I do see a lot of this as well. Um, and even though kids have anxiety, a lot of it does can come from the parents. I'm sure there is research, um, you know, Dr. Gornitsky and Dr. Dieppe's page, uh, paper that I referenced, uh, pub published in J. Posna, um, talks about coping skills um, in, in, in children. Um, so I would, you know, I think that's a good place to start. Um, um, if, if you're interested in that. Tiffany, if I could, um, if I could follow up on that, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the group in Children's LA showed nicely that parent anxiety correlated with post-operative analgesic use by children undergoing spine surgery. That, that's a direct answer perhaps to what Dr. Sawal was wondering about. That, um, you know, in pediatric orthopedics, we treat the entire family, not just the patient. Um, and we are all struggling with the parental part, as Dr. Sawal was saying, that part, that influence. And so if we do start t doing intake forms, we should probably give them to the parents as well in the pediatric space. Yeah, absolutely. See any other uh, comments or thoughts from our audience? Not sure if Dr. Ring is still on the line, but I'd be interested to hear um, your thoughts on the work that you guys have been doing out uh, at UT Austin. That was a great talk, Tiffany. You know, I think I, what we stopped using the term cognitive bias in our writing because cognitive, on the one hand, cognitive bias is not always a bad thing. So the, the guessing part of your brain can be very valuable. Think about facial recognition or decisions that you make in the trauma bay. Um, and you can actually train, um, some of Kahneman's more recent work is that you can train your automatic thinking um, to, to be more, uh, to, do critical thinking rapidly, essentially, would be a way to, to think about it or train how the story that your mind tells in danger quickly. And the other thing is that the term bias just turns everybody off. I think it's got such a negative connotation in terms of um, you know, vested interest or uh, somehow self-interest. Uh, but um, the, the thing I would add in general to what you're saying is, we can see from the evidence clearly that we need to be practicing in the biopsychosocial model and the benefits to our patients of doing so. But implementing it has not been easy. And it's mostly because we bump up against the mental health stigma. Mm -hmm. And so that's where communication strategies come in. So it might be the case that I have a social worker in my office and you've seen that firsthand, but you've probably also seen that you cannot bring the social worker in the room unless they're invited. Otherwise you will offend. And right. so there's still the element of insight, motivational interviewing to become more open to different ways of thinking about getting healthy uh, so that people actually invite uh, in the mental and social health uh, professional. And for that to happen, we have to be able to, as you mentioned, we have to be able to start that conversation and do it in a way that does is not threatening to the relationship. And that's something that I work on every day to try to get better at that. I just have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a quick comment. So one of the things that I, I agree that this issue of the mental health stigma is, is huge because no one wants to hear that the pain is in the, it's all in their head. Um, so one of the things that, that we use in our program is um, 
uh, pain neuroscience education. So it's basically trying to um, frame all these issues in, in terms of the mechanisms of the nervous system in, in a way that patients can understand. Um, so we have a whole system of, of booklets and educational materials. Um, and at the, you know, there is some decent evidence supporting that, but I think it does help to try and get patients to steer the conversation away from, you know, this is all about how you're reacting to sort of grounding it in, in what's happening physiologically in, in their body. So that's another avenue to consider. And yeah, one of my colleagues is, is a big, big fan of using physiological frameworks to get people interested in mental health. We read our two studies, one of them is quantitative and one's qualitative. It's not clear that that's the solution. I mm -hmm. think it's, I think you meet people where they're at. I think it works for some people, right. but other people read right through it and they're like, you're saying it's all in my head. <laughs> Great. All right. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ring, for being here and for your comments and uh, definitely appreciate it. And uh, see a hand up from Dr. Center also. Yeah, thanks, Drew, and thanks, um, Dr. Liu, for this great uh, um, talk. I wanted to um, bring up a local expert whose name is uh, Rachel Zafnis. Dr. Zafnis is a, for those of you looking for resources uh, for PEDS, chronic pain, she's a pain psychologist in East Bay in Berkeley. And um, our group's worked with her um, over the years, uh, but she's a great speaker and a, a, a great clinician, a great psychologist. Um, she's actually published a few um, workbooks uh, because she, you know, is very much in touch with the fact that not everyone, not everyone can see her and that these problems are uh, widespread. And so if you, um, so Dr. Faustine Ramirez, um, with Cindy Chang's um, help, recently got a grant and received a number of these workbooks. Uh, so you could reach out to us in primary care sports if, if you think that um, a supply of these workbooks would be useful for your clinics. I think the age group uh, where this would be appropriate would be sort of up to college level. Um, although there is an adult set as well. Um, she's a peds pain psych psychologist, but, you know, let me know, let Cindy know if this might help you. Great. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? Drew, maybe I'll just add a, a, a more of a question, but we talked recently in Grand Rounds about some of the maladies of our fee-for-service healthcare economy. And David, you're working now at uh, UT Austin, and you've got a um, more of an ACO type of organization there, a really integrated healthcare system. How are you able to um, essentially get providers paid for services like cognitive behavioral therapy and for uh, mental health evaluations and treatments in an integrated system that might not be as available to us in a fee-for-service economy. And we were able to get an alternative payment model with the county payer, which covers just over 100,000 people. Um, we were not able, the South is a place where fee-for-service still does well, and, we, and trying to get people interested in alternative payment models there was probably harder than in California or New England. Um, I think it's still hard every, anywhere, but I'll tell you that it's been great to be able to play around in an alternative payment model. Uh, and it, it really does work because I'm, I'm, I have, let's say I get somebody coming in um, on the Travis County uh, safety net insurance and they're, they're in their forties and they're diagnosed with carpal tunnel. Half of those people are gonna be ready for surgery. You know, it's like a very high surgery rate. They've, been, they've had trouble with access or, or, or not um, sought access. And so in a, if I have an alternative payment model, which is a diagnosis-based bundle, which is what we have, so I'm not, it's not like total knee, uh, here's your bundle, it's carpal tunnel, new patient, you, here's your bundle, um, and half of them have surgery. If I did those in the surgery center, I'd lose a lot of money by doing them in the office. I didn't do any nerve tests. And if we can anticipate difficult recoveries and have them work with the social worker before we do surgery, just as you would do in a knee arthroplasty bundle, and so in doing that, um, we can work within an alternative payment model and uh, cut away resources that might be given to a surgery center and then give those over to social workers. So it's been fun to see that. 
Do you find a difference in the outcome? And specifically, it's a bit paradoxical that your insured patients actually get less integrated care than your uh, county patients. So is it, do you see that reflected in outcomes? And do you see actually better outcomes in the county patients, which might be counterintuitive? I, I think so. I mean, I think you, you, we always look and we say better outcomes. Like I always talk to my spine guy, Mark Corral, who's a physiatrist, and he's like, oh, please don't judge me on whether I moved the patient reported outcome measure. That's, that's a tall task for somebody who's had back pain for a year and been in care all over the uh, city of Austin. Just judge me on whether I do MRIs, injections, and surgeries. I'll win that game. And if you can have equal patient reported outcome measures with doing less, uh, that's, that's a win. And I think, I think we can look at it similarly um, if people are getting uh, stiff fingers or they're not happy because their severe carpal tunnel didn't completely resolve, we're not doing more steroid injections, lots of hand therapy or repeat surgeries. Um, the patient report outcome measures are what they are. They're probably a little better with social work um, in, uh, involvement, uh, hard, to, hard to show for, for sure and would need to be done in a randomized trial. But I think you can see the secondary benefits pretty easily. Great. Um, and it looks like we are just about at time. Uh, so I think we'll wrap up there. But um, Dr. Lou, thank you again so much. Um, congrats on a great talk. And um, thank you all for joining. Next week, uh, our speaker will be Dr. Letitia Bradford, and that's our annual chair lecture. Uh, we'll have a 630 journal club um, discussing uh, mentorship diversity and uh, followed by her talk. So it should be a great session again. So We'll see you all then.